thought it'd be good to review a little bit of what the apparatus is called in an acid-base titration. So, first of all, you'd probably want to pipette some uh, known quantity of, of a reactant inside of an Erlenmeyer flask, and you would use maybe a 10 milliliter pipette, uh, use a pipette pump that's attached to it, and as the titration proceeds, you're going to be pouring from a burette into the flask, swirling continuously, looking for a color change of an indicator. The reason we're doing a titration in the first place is to perhaps find an unknown concentration, an unknown concentration of something that is inside of the burette and or a titrant inside of the Erlenmeyer flask. Everything's held together here by the retort stand and the burette clamp. Oh, acid-based titrations, they're the most beautiful graphs in the world to be able to make. Okay, so let's take a very simple reaction like hydronium plus hydroxide makes 2H2O. And let's say we have equal concentrations of the base and the acid in solution. And we've got 10 milliliters of acid in that bottom Erlenmeyer flask that we were looking at. And we've got sodium hydroxide in the burette. Now what volume do you think we're going to need of that hydroxide to completely neutralize that acid? Equal concentrations, one to one ratio, 10 mils here, we're going to need 10 mils. How does this titration look if we continually pour hydroxide and then exceed that 10 milliliters uh, past that point of equivalence? Well, when we graph pH versus milliliters of NaOH added, always label your axes, we're going to start off with a high pH because of the presence of, we're going to start with a low pH because of the presence of the hydronium in the bottom flask. And then, as we titrate, all of a sudden, boom, we are going to get a huge change when we get to that point, close to that point of equivalence. So, the point of equivalence is always found when you take the greatest change on your graph and go to the middle of it. And right there, ladies and gentlemen, is where you should find your equivalence point. That means that right here, in terms of milliliters of NaOH added, there would be 10 mils right there, and what's the pH at that equivalence point? Why 7? Because water is present. Oh yeah, water and the ions that are swimming around in solution like sodium ions and chloride ions. So you'd have salt water at the equivalence point if you really did the titration well. But don't drink it. Don't do that. <laughs> now, hey, look what I put on here for you. What's the indicator you would use if you didn't want to actually have to do the titration and graph it, but you just wanted to nail the equivalence point right away, maybe to calculate an unknown volume or concentration? Well, which indicator actually brackets that equivalence point very well? Bromothymol blue at 6.0 or 7.6, because the pH here at the equivalence point is going to be 7. And so, it goes from, if you put the indicator into the original Erlenmeyer flask where the acid is, It'll go yellow, 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 green, and then blue. It's very difficult to get that green uh, color because the pH changes so very quickly given a little bit of volume. So getting the green here means that you've got a really great titration if you use bromothymol blue indicator. By the way, when you get that green color, or whatever color you end off with in a titration, that's called getting the end Point. The end point is the point at which the color changes in the titration. The equivalence point is that one point where the exact mole to mole ratio is achieved. The end point could be anywhere along here that you stop, but there is only one equivalence point. Now, if you have that weak base being titrated into a weak acid, okay, titration curve looks a little bit different. Now, we have a little schnick at the beginning, but that's not that vital. We just have a little upsurge in pH and then a leveling off before we get to that equivalence point, which will be right about there. So the graph looks just a little bit different. It's a little bit of a schnick at the beginning there. I don't know what you'd call that. A little upsurge in pH before it levels off. It levels off because this region right here is where a buffer is formed and it doesn't like to change its pH but all of a sudden it has to once you run out of chemical in order to cause a buffer. You've, you've exceeded the buffer capacity of the solution. Now, 
the pH going to be here in terms of the equivalence point, which is in the middle of the greatest change, greatest slope? Well, remember that at the equivalence point, you are going to have no more of the reactants, but you're going to have product left. And the product here is not just water, but it's a base ion. So the pH at the equivalence point is going to be greater than 7. So I would put 7 down here and say that pH right there has got to be a number higher than 7 at the equivalence point for any titration where you're pouring in a strong base into a weak acid. By the way, in this case, the pH would probably be between, I'd say, 8 and 10, and a good indicator to use to get an endpoint here would be phenolphthalein. Why is chemistry so cool? Because it's so logical and it just works so beautifully. Look at this titration curve. Here we have the sodium carbonate being titrated by the hydronium, the HCl. And of course there's two equations because that two negative charge there can accept two protons. Two equations to give us that one net equation. The titration curve for this when you're pouring the HCl into the carbonate ion looks like this. A little schnick at the beginning kind of levels off then once, then twice. There are two equivalence points, two bumps, because there are two equations. Ah, oh, it's beautiful. And the product here in the end is carbonic acid. By the way, whenever you get carbonic acid as a product, it starts to fizz because that is actually CO2 and H2O. Cool. So the pH of that carbonic acid is probably going to be around 3 or 4, and that's why you would use, for the second equivalence point here, to be able to get that in a titration, you'd use methyl orange indicator. Titrations don't have to be done in graphing pH versus a volume of something added. You can actually do titrations measuring temperature of, a, of two solutions being mixed together or their conductivity. So you may be able to uh, see these uh, uh, in textbooks and uh, hopefully on, on exams too and you'll be prepared when, let's say NaOH is being titrated into HCl. Well, what actually happens in terms of temperature is that the closer you get to the equivalence point, the greater the amount of reaction that takes place, and so therefore, the warmer the solution gets, because these reactions are highly exothermic, these acid-base ones. And so therefore, guess what that is right there? The highest point always indicates to you the equivalence point. That is the equivalence point in the reaction at the top of the highest point of, of temperature gained in the solution. Now if we have that same situation where uh, hydronium reacts with hydroxide or NAC, uh, NaOH is reacting with HCl and you measure the conductivity, usually it's done in resistance so the unit would be in ohms and you, and you measure that versus time, the greatest dip in conductivity occurs at the equivalence point. You still have sodium and chloride ions floating around in that example uh, in, in HCl and NaOH at the equivalence point, but you don't have hydronium and hydroxide ions floating around as well, and so charge goes down, and so the equivalence point in a reaction where conductivity is being measured versus time, that's at the lowest point.